uh, AD. However, they were included as part of the Christian scripture in the fourth century or from the fourth century AD. The scripture of the apostles, we would say confidently, was the 39 books of the Hebrew Bible. That was the scripture of the apostles. But let me now comment on my earlier assertion on why labeling the Hebrew Bible, the OT, is a little bit problematic. In this canon of scripture, which we call the OT, was the old covenant in the law and the prophets. Therein also was the new covenant in promise. What we call the New Testament records the fulfillment of the new covenant. What we are saying is, without what we call the Old Testament, there is no New Testament. Why? Because the New Testament is embedded in the Old Testament. That is very, very important. There is a difference between the Old Covenant, which is renewed in Christ, and the Hebrew Bible. There is a, quite a difference. There, there is also a difference between the New Covenant and the books that were written by the apostles. May I say this, that the atoning sacrifices in the Old Covenant were collapsed into one more efficacious sacrifice that is the death of Jesus Christ. I'm saying that all the sacrifices that atoned for sin in the old covenant, they were all collapsed in the atoning death of Jesus Christ, such that all that was in the old covenant that constituted a uh, the redemption of human being, the forgiveness of human sin was collapsed when God gave a more efficacious sacrifice than what was there before, before Jesus Christ. However, all the worship offerings in the old covenant were carried forward minus the limitations due to, due to the enablement by the Holy Spirit. We are saying all the worship offerings in the Old Testament were carried into the new covenant and they were enabled at a greater level by the Holy Spirit who fell down on the believers on the day of Pentecost and who abides in us every day. Something else, these 66 books are holy individually and equally scripture. That alone is a Christian's uh, guide in faith and in practice. We cannot leave the Old Testament behind to be led by the New Testament. And we cannot uh, just hold on to what we may call the New Testament and forsake the Old Testament. This means that there is no other foundation of claim that a man can lay except the one in these 66 books. I heard of a story that one Hindu man was given the New Testament to read. And after finishing reading it, he went to the person who gave him the New Testament books and he told him, where is the other half? Then he was asked, how do you know that there's another half? He said, why? Because after reading, I find that there is something else that is missing. So give me the other half. So he had to give him the Old Testament to read. Why? Because none is complete without the other. Now, to support that, hear this. The Hebrew prophets authenticated their speech with the formula, Ko ama Adonai. That is Hebrew for, thus says the Lord. They used to say, what we are telling you is not our word. It comes from the Lord. Thus says the Lord. This Lord they were invoking to support the Old Testament scripture has never changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
that we that means whatever they spoke has not changed it is settled in heaven and god watches over it to perform it that means we can claim every claim or every promise in their what we call the old testament we have a right to claim the apostles also authenticated their words with the formula in greek kados gegraftai that means as it is written what are they saying uh they were supporting whatever they claimed and whatever they wrote with what we call the old testament that means to them the old testament what we call the old testament was very important to them it is supported whatever they were preaching whatever they were claiming about jesus christ it was supported by what we call the old testament that is telling us that if, what is written in the old testament is very very important it is what supports the new testament without it the claims of the new testament hold no water blessed be the name of the lord now jesus himself authenticated his words with the claim or with the words verily verily i say to you as god he could not authenticate his words with any other that means his ethos his person and his position within the godhead conferred his words with undoubtable truth value that was jesus christ he never authenticated his words with thus says the lord he also never at any other time said it is written except when the devil quoted the bible to him and he had to refute it but as long as he preached the word and claimed something about himself he would say verily verily i say to you let me repeat as god he could not authenticate his words with any other his ethos his person and position within the godhead conferred his words with undoubtable truth value now having put the record straight on what is scripture let me now introduce the topic that i will share today and that i will continue with tomorrow the topic is the effect of knowing god the effect of knowing god we will use the life of abraham as our example and i am sure god will bless us we we'll use abraham as our example but just before we get into the new topic i would want to ask if there's any person who has any question on what i have shared concerning the bible or the scripture is there any question or they can be they can be asked after we continue sharing on the topic today's topic now in the bible abraham is introduced as a descendant of shem he lived with his father tera in a place called ua of the chaldeans the mention of the chaldean is to show us that he used to worship conceptual gods of the people or of the nation of the chaldeans so worshiping conceptual gods is not a new thing it was there before until the time god revealed himself so he was worshiping the god of the chaldeans god had not revealed himself 
to his people that particular time. But Genesis 12, 1 tells us, we can read verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Let's break down that those, uh, the first verse of this wonderful scripture. And I know God is going to bless us. Now, according to Exodus 6.2, by this time, God had not revealed his name, Yahweh, which was vocalized as Lord or Adonai. By the time of Abraham, God had not revealed himself in his personal name. He, was, he had revealed himself as El Shaddai. That means God the Almighty. So the writing of this first verse that Jehovah God said to Abraham shows us that this portion of scripture was written after God had revealed himself as the I am in the book of Exodus. So it must have been written after the wilderness wanderings or during the time of the wilderness or after the wilderness. This is what this word shows. Now, this God spoke to Abraham and he told him, get out of your country. That means leave your people, leave the things that you know, and go to a place that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. It was a promise. After he promised him that he will make you, him a great nation, that he will bless him, he will make his name great, that those people who bless him, he will bless them. Those people who curse him, he will curse them. Verse 4 says, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. God spoke and Abraham believed what God had spoken. Now, this one shows us that <clears throat> Abraham, Abraham's knowledge of the revealed God produced obedience. The first thing it produced was obedience. The knowledge of God should produce obedience. Disobedience shows that we have not encountered the self-revealed God. And sometimes it shows we have not forsaken the conceptual gods that are in our minds to follow the revealed God. Why? Because the conceptual gods sometimes because they are not relational. They cannot talk. Some of them, they don't talk. They don't say anything. They are just thought about then each person's concepts direct their behavior. So those people who are led by conceptual gods, they obey their instincts, what they think is right. Sometimes you read to them scripture, then they will tell you, I don't believe that. I believe this way. Why? Because they are led by their thinking about who God is, not the word of God according to what scripture is. 
But the knowledge of the revealed God and the faith in the revealed God causes the person to whom he has revealed himself to obey the word of the Lord. So we are saying the first thing that the knowledge of God buds is obedience to God. We can therefore know whether people know they are God by their behavior. The Bible says in Antioch of Syria, where the Christians congregated after the persecutions in Jerusalem, they behaved so much like Christ because they had met the revealed God in Christ. That knowledge changed them to the likeness of Christ, so much so that when people saw them, they called them Christ-like people. And that is where we got the term Christians. So Christians or Christianity means those people who in faith and deed, they behave like the one they believe. They behave like the one who has revealed himself to them or like the God who has revealed himself to them in Christ. They follow this Christ so much so that because they know he represents the God they believe in. So the knowledge of who God is in Christ causes us or it births in us Christ-like behavior. So Christianity should mean doing like Christ, behaving like Christ, doing everything like Christ. Actually, it is not a religion. It, is, it is, should be an imitation of somebody, an imitation of the one we believe in, an imitation of the one who has revealed to us, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, the book of Hebrews sheds more light on this scripture when it is says that his obedience was prompted by his faith. Chapter 11 of this book, verse 8, which we can read. Hebrews 11, verse 8. Let me read. This is what the Bible says. Hebrews 11. It is says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. When we know the God of revelation, the self-revealing God, there is something that happens between us and him. Faith grows. Faith grows by meeting or hearing the self-revealed God. This is why the Bible says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out. What are we saying? The knowledge of the self-revealed God creates Faith. That is why we were, when, when we read yesterday, we saw that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When we hear from the one who has self-revealed himself to us, faith grows in us. Do we want to grow our faith for maturity? Then we should meet the self-revealing God in scripture, blessed be the name of the Lord. So it is necessary for us, if we want to know God, to get ourselves immersed in scripture. Hallelujah. Now, Abraham was not, Abraham's faith, I would say, 
was not just a credo of faith. Creed. It was not a quotation of a creed. It was more than that. Sometimes we who have lived in church, we know sometimes we just practice the credo of faith, whereby we go on Sunday, we repeat the Apostles' Creed, we repeat the Nician Creed, we repeat other creeds that have been adopted by the church. But then sometimes if you follow this person who has cited or recited the Apostles' Creed and the Nician Creed, and you follow their deeds, then you find the deeds are not matching the creed that we confess. But let me say Abraham's faith was not a credo of faith. It was a relational faith. Why? He had not just recited about him. He had known him. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. This one takes me to this example of this great man of the first of the second century. His name was Polycarp. That time there were, it was during the time of persecution. And this man Polycarp was about to be uh, persecuted or to be martyred. And they told him to recant his faith in Jesus Christ. And they told him, if you do not recant, we are going to burn you on the stake or to tie you on a stake and burn you. He looked at his persecutors, those people who are ready to kill him. And he asked them a question, told them, for the last 80 years, I have known this Jesus. He has revealed himself to me and he has done me no wrong. He has always been good to me. How can I deny him now? This is my head. I am ready to die. Do it now. I will meet him after this. The knowledge of God, the self-revealed revealed one, especially in Jesus Christ, produces such boldness in faith such that you are ready to die for the one you believe in. Sometimes doubts come about our faith when we have not met the self-revealing God. Polycarp teaches us that the knowledge of the self-revealed God is so, so important. And especially in times of tribulation, in times of martyrdom, it is necessary to have a right knowledge of the God of revelation. Anybody who has a concept of God during the time of persecution, it is possible to change your concept of God. But if you have met him and known him through revelation, then you cannot deny him. We need the God of revelation to stand in times of serious persecution. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. You can say that it was a, Abraham's faith was a faith that directed his every deed it was a practical faith. When you know the God of revelation, your faith becomes very practical. It ceases being the family creed or the tribal creed or the denominational creed. It becomes a faith that directs your every deed. It becomes a practical faith. It is a faith that translates to action in line with the dictates of your object of faith. When you know God, the self-revealing God, your faith in him translates to acting in line with this word. You remember the disciples? When they were met by Jesus Christ, washing their nets because they had caught no fish at night. And Jesus Christ requested that he uses their net, their, their boats. 
And after using their boats, he spoke to Peter and the sons of Zebedee. And he told them, cast your boats, draw your boats into the deep, and there you will catch fish. And they were professional fishermen. They told Jesus Christ, Jesus, we have toiled the whole night and we have caught no fish. And we are professional fishermen. Fish are not caught during the day. But they looked at him. Yes, Jesus was the self-revealed God. He was God revealed in Jesus Christ. So they told him, Jesus Christ, at your word, we will obey. Because we have spoken it, we will obey. The knowledge of the self-revealed God, it obeys even when the mind doubts. It is a faith that obeys even when circumstances speak otherwise. That time the circumstances were speaking otherwise. But because they had that knowledge of the self-revealing God, they obeyed Jesus. We know it is to us it is not possible. But because you, who is a self-revealed God, I'm adding, has spoken, then we will obey. And when they obey, the Bible says, they caught a multitude of fish until their nets started breaking. They had to call their friends to come and assist them. When you believe in God, you'll be able to share those blessings with people. The blessing that comes out of the knowledge of God is so much such that it will be shared out with other people. Now, we also see something about Abraham, that from the time of his call and the time of his faith, Abraham started acting according to the will of the one he had believed in. He started acting, you know, there before he had believed in the conceptual gods of their fathers. But from that moment, he changed completely. Romans 12 tells us that we should no longer conform ourselves to the dictates of our former conceptual thinking about God, but we should rather be transformed by the renewing of our minds and especially in the new found faith in the God who has revealed himself in scripture. Now, such kind of faith, it gives the believer purpose in life. It gives the believer purpose in life, such that knowledge and faith in the self-revealed God gives the believer purpose in life. It gives Abraham purpose in life. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And especially as he conformed himself to the image of the object of his worship. What am I saying? Now, when the self-revealing God reveals himself, what happens, that knowledge causes you to desire to be like that God, such that every moment you are looking unto him, as the Bible tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We have an image, we have a mirror image of the person we would want to become like. And in him, we get our purpose of life. In him, we get our purpose of seeking and prayer. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, yes, we get purpose. We want to be conformed like him. Paul says, in Philippians 3, 8 to 11. Philippians 3, 8 to 11. Allow me to read it. This is what he says. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Allow me to paraphrase and say, Yet indeed, I also count all things 
I also count my conceptual thinking about God lost for the excellence of knowing Jesus Christ, the self-revealed God. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Then Paul continues to say, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Once you know him, you are ready to suffer loss of all other things. He becomes so excellent. You want to follow him. You want to understand him. You want him to become your sole purpose in life. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Then he says, and I count all other things as rubbish that I may gain him and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul, when Paul met Jesus Christ on his road to Damascus, and he believed in him as Lord of his life, he got new purpose in life. Actually, he forgot, if he considered all the other things but loss for the excellency of knowing this God. It is necessary, friends, to have knowledge about this God and everything about him. Why? Because he becomes a mirror to you. You want to know him. You want to be conformed to him. You want to be like him. And actually your ultimate price in life becomes becoming like the one you believe in. So we should get purpose. For us to grow in the kingdom, we must know God through scripture. We must know God through Jesus Christ, the revealed God. We must understand him and follow him in knowledge and in understanding. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Something else from Abraham. Knowledge of the self-revealed God, but worship. It produces worship. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ told the woman of Samaria, you Samaritans, you worship what you do not know or who you do not know because salvation is of the Jews. What I actually was telling them is God has revealed himself to us. So because we know him, we worship what we know. We do not worship the concepts of what we think our God is. We actually worship what we know. So knowledge of that God produces all but worship. When God appeared to Abraham in Canaan, in Genesis 13, 17 to 8, the Bible says he built altars. He built one at Mamre, the first one, and there he worshiped God. Then he went ahead to a place called Bethel. Bethel means the house of God, Bet and El. It means the house of God. There also he built an altar. On these altars, they were not just uh, empty places. Altars were used for worship. Yes. Now, the sacrifices that were laid on the altar they were sacrifices that spoke two things. The first thing that the sacrifice spoke was, I surrender myself to you. The pouring of the blood of the victim of sacrifice, it was speaking to the one that he believed in, that this blood that I poured here, is a representation of my life. And it is speaking to you, God, that I lay my life to you. I surrender my life to you. That is what blood stood for when it was poured on the altar. It is stood for the life of the offerer, not the life of the victim. 
So it was speaking, my life I give to you. It is like today when we sing this life, my life is not my own, to you I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. That is what the sacrifice spoke, that to, my life is not my own. I give it to you. I mean, to you I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is what the first thing that I believe the sacrifice of Abraham meant. It was a worship offering. So those altars meant worship. Number two, the voice of sacrifice, the second voice of offering. This is what it says. Mm -hmm. It is, says this, you know, it, the body was burned and the smell of the meat ascended as a sweet smelling savor to the Lord in the death of the victim. This is what happened. Now, <clears throat> that one now meant fellowship with God. I am fellowshipping with you, with this victim of sacrifice as my possession. It meant the offerer is ready to share not only himself in the blood, but also what he owns in the body of the victim. So it is spoke two things that what I am and what I have, I surrender both to you. The deepest kind of worship, when you know Jehovah God, the self-revealed God, you give the deepest kind of worship, which involves worshiping with who you are and what you have. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So Abraham worshipped with all that he was and with all that he, was, uh, that he had in on those altars. It is necessary to know God, the self-revealed God, what we are saying. Any gift outside the knowledge of God doesn't glorify God. Any offering outside the knowledge of God doesn't glorify God. It is glorifies God when it is given in a way that it is speaks worship to God. Am I saying that Sunday offerings sometimes can mean nothing. Tithes can mean nothing if they are not given in the knowledge of who God is. If they do not speak something to God, if they don't speak worship to God, then they should not be given. They are just an empty ritual. Mm -hmm. So like Abraham, we should give in understanding of the self-revealed God, and they should speak. Yes, what do they speak? I surrender myself to you, and I also surrender what I have to you. Me and mine, we belong to you. Hallelujah. Yes, we and ours should belong to God. And every other gift should be given in that knowledge and that understanding. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Yes. Something else. Knowledge of the self-revealed God, births giving. It produces giving. We can say that Abraham, after knowing the self-revealed God, he became the father of giving. Yes. In chapter 14 of the book of Genesis, after he had rescued his brother Lot from the kings who had captured him, on his way back, he met somebody 
who was called Melchizedek. Melchizedek is composed of two words, Melech, king, Sadiq, righteousness. So he is a Melech of righteousness, the king of righteousness. If we read the book of Isaiah, we will see who Jesus Christ is. Hallelujah. Yes, he is also a king. This Melchizedek was a type of Jesus, according to the book of Hebrew. Hallelujah. Hebrew 7, 6 to 10. He was a type of Jesus Christ. So when Abraham gave sacrifices or a tithe to Melchizedek, actually, in symbol form, he gave to the one who lives forevermore. He was not giving it to man. He was giving to the one who lives forevermore. He was speaking to him. It was a gift that spoke that me, this victory was not mine. It is yours, oh God. Yes, everything that we give, for example, even if you give a gift out of your salary, you are saying this salary is not mine. It belongs to you. This victory you have given me this month is not my victory. It is your victory, oh God. And it becomes a deep worship to the Lord. Abraham was such a worship, a worshiping man or a worshiper of God. Why? He had known him. When you know him, you don't give because of the law. You give out of love. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You don't give because the law says so. You are giving because it is a deep worship. It is a gift that is speaking. What do your tithes speak? Do they speak? What do your Sunday offerings speak? Do they speak? Or are they empty, religious, rituals that say nothing? Abraham's giving spoke. Let me show you how Abraham's gift spoke. When he was told by God to offer Isaac, his son, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, verse 17, it is by faith that he gave. It is faith that prompted him to give. And he was telling himself, even if I give, the one who gave me is able to give me another Isaac. He is able to raise him from, actually he is able to raise him from the dead. And there in what Abraham did, we see a type of resurrection of Jesus Christ in Isaac. He is able to resurrect him. The same faith in Jesus Christ, he gave himself to die knowing that you resurrect on the third day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So in knowing God, the self-revealed self one, we get such boldness to give anything to God and to his work. Knowledge of God also attaches us to his work, to his agenda in this world. We need to be, to have the knowledge of God, to be attached to his work. Why? Because we will know that everything that we do in the Lord is not in vain. It is necessary to know him, that he is a rewarder of them that seek him diligently. That if we seek him, everything that we do in his name is not in vain. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Yes. When we know God, like Abraham, we will become givers like Abraham. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, I encourage each one of us. Let's have the faith of Abraham. Let's know God the way Abraham knew him. Let's follow him the way Abraham followed him. And when we do that, we will be blessed of him. We will grow in understanding. We will grow to the maturity that 
we should grow to. We shall grow to the maturity, like the Bible says in, uh, in our theme scripture, that we grow to the stature of Christ Jesus, the self-revealed God. So can I conclude by saying, if we know the self-revealed God in Jesus Christ, we will grow to his very stature. And especially because when he is finally revealed on the last day, we shall see him the way he is, and we shall understand him the way he is, and we shall be, we shall be conformed to be like him. Let's know the self-revealed God in scripture. May God bless you so much this evening. Peace of God. I'll Amen. reserve the rest of the time for Amen. any question. Amen. 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 What a word. And I want to believe that uh, we are blessed. We've, we've had this, the effect of knowing God very well connected to yesterday's message. And uh, I'm blessed. I'm challenged. And I'm stirred up. And I bless the Lord for, for that message. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Dr. Mwaneki Karura. Uh, when we call him doctor, behind him, it's not a, it's not a screensaver. It's not a background. Those are books. <laughs> and it's always a, a blessing to sit under your teaching. I envy students who sit under your teaching every day. It's, 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 such, it's such a great thing. And we, we bless the Lord. All glory is to God. We were told yesterday, Utukufu inaludi kwake mungu. It is not yes, ours. Yes. We are just vessels in his hearts. We are instruments that he uses for his glory. Like, like the bishop have, have said, um, I would like to ask if you have a question. We are free here. We allow questions. You can just unmute if you have a question, a comment. Um, I, I can see we have quite a number of uh, ministers together with us, and I, I really appreciate each and every one of you. Pastor Kamau Kiari from our church house of worship, Kamuru, who pastors together with me. Pastor Arias Kagushia from CMC Utawara. I can see uh, Pastor Reverend Derija Wairago from C, uh, CM, CMF Utawara again. And uh, maybe at some point I'll be asking you to say hi to us. Uh, Leverett Mwaneki, my presbyter, Presbyter Mwaneki, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Leverett Eric Odoyo from Deliverance Church, Kedurai 45, you've been together with us uh, through this session and even the previous session. We, we are so grateful. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I don't know whether there's any other minister. Uh, Reverend Evans Waweru from Worldwide Gospel Church of Kenya in Gedoguri, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We are blessed. Thank you even for other friends who've joined us. Uh, Weary and Grace from Wema TV. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are blessed. We are blessed. My son, Peter Murray, I can see you. God bless you so much. And everyone who've joined us, all the members of House of Worship, Kamuru, who are together with us, my son, Amos. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Baba Keegan, for being there. We are blessed to have all of you, Kevin Karaja. Thank you for coming. I'm saying this so that if anyone has a question, they are warming up. They are warming up and uh, gaining the courage. Anyone who would have a question uh, before we release uh, Bishop? Seems like there is none. And like we indicated, you are free to send your questions to me. Uh, you are free to make your comments. Maybe I should also look at those who are watching us on Facebook to make sure that uh, there's no question that we are leaving behind. Um, hmm. This called the Bread of Life Conference. The, the bread is broken. It is now your duty to, uh, to, to, to pick up your piece and, uh, and, and chew and digest. And uh, then you can't eat bread and it leaves you the same. There will always be an effect on you. Uh, Reverend Dereja, Elijah Wairago, say hi to us. We are so privileged to have you joining us tonight. If you are in a position to say hi to us, we will be grateful to hear your voice. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Bernard Waroe. I'm so much delighted to join this conference. I'm so much blessed. The word was so clear. I'm so much blessed. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Bishop Dr. Mwaneki Karura, 
because of the very power of word that you have ministered unto us. I believe that our lives will never be the same again. And in fact, even our giving will not just be in vain. We shall not be giving uh, just like uh, a religious way. We shall turn our giving to worship. And I do believe that each and every one of us have been blessed by that word. And I believe that our lives will never be the same again. I wish this conference would have continued. I have known today that there is a conference from Pastor Arias uh, Duku Kagushia, and I'm so much blessed by that session. God bless you so much. There is a session that I had, uh, uh, I had a rap, simply because in Utawara it uh, was leaning so heavily to a point that uh, I think for like uh, 10 minutes I was away, but I'm so much blessed. God bless you so much, uh, Leverett uh, Bernard Waroe, for that session, I'm so much blessed. God bless every reason uh, and every person who have listened even through the Facebook and also through this session. May God bless you so much. I'm so much blessed. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Raija. Uh, we, we are delighted to have you. And thank you very much also, Reverend Victor. Thank you very much. Uh, I, this was clear. Uh, and, and, and I bless the Lord for you. Are you in a position to also say hi, Reverend Victor? Are you able to say hi? Uh, before we look at the a question that is there on our chat. Reverend Victor, are you able to say hi? Yes, I can. I don't know if you can see me. We can hear you clearly and we can see you. Ah, that's good. Praise God. Thank you very much Amen. for having me. My name is Victor and I'm in the UK. It's been a blessing. I am so, so much blessed. I, I love it when the word is broken down in such a way that we are able to eat and digest and it's gonna be nourishment to us. I've especially today been uh, taught on the benefits of knowing the Lord and I will pursue in the knowledge of the Lord that I might worship him better and that I might get deeper in my relationship with him. Thank you very much, Reverend Bernard Waroy. Thank you very much, Bishop. May the Lord God bless you. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Reverend Victor. You know, uh, we are in times when there is no limitation. We can cross borders without a visa. You can see uh, Bishop Dr. Mwaneki, the UK is being impacted. Uh, you know, COVID can't, can't stop the church, never. So thank you very much. Uh, there's a question here, Bishop uh, Mwaneki, that Seventh-day Adventists have very strong arguments for adhering to the laws of the Sabbath. Bishop, if the Old Testament was not done away with, how far should we go? How far should we go? Do we need to start putting out fires on Friday at 6 p.m.? <laughs> you are muted, Bishop. Am I, am I being heard? Oh, thank you very much. Yes, yes, now. <clears throat> now, uh, when, we, when we say that the, you know, Christ came, and he interpreted the word of God, the Old Testament to us, such that those, the word that was not interpreted by the Pharisees and by the teachers of the law before Christ was interpreted by Christ. So when Christ interprets the Old Testament, he interprets it with the power of verily, verily, I say to you. So when we say is the Sabbath was not made for, I mean, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. I mean, he has interpreted this, the Old Testament, the way it ought to have been interpreted. The other one was not interpreted well. That is why we called it legalism. But Jesus Christ came to interpret the Bible for us, the Old Testament for us. So it is Christ's interpretation of the Sabbath that counts, him being the one who started it, him being God. The biggest problem that we have is not what the Bible says. I mean, it is not what is written. It is the interpretation of the word of God. So they may be wrong on interpretation. They should follow Jesus's interpretation not their own interpretation. It is possible sometimes to interpret uh, the Bible according to our concepts and understanding. Everything that Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ comes, he, one, fulfills the law. He fulfills the law and the prophet. They talk about him. 
right? So he interprets the Bible for us, we follow his interpretation. So the problem is not in, uh, in, in the Sabbath, it is in their interpretation of the Sabbath. What does the Sabbath mean? Does it mean uh, a day that, uh, that, I mean, a, a day that is people call the seventh day? Or what does the Sabbath mean, actually? Sabbath does not mean a day. It means the rest of the Lord. So it doesn't mean Saturday. It means the rest of the Lord. So Christ came to interpret the scripture for us. And he has interpreted it for us. He interpreted it. He actually showed what we should do and what we should not. Right? So he is very, very clear about what they call the Sabbath. Let not the misinterpretation of, the, of what we call the Old Testament cause us to think about that the, 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 what we call the Old Testament has been invalidated knowing. Actually, during the times of the apostles, there was no other, there was no other Bible. There were only the 39 books of the Hebrew Bible, which were considered to be inspired, every iota of it. And when Jesus Christ says, not even a dot will be removed, he meant everything that is written in that book. So let not mis misinterpreters of the Bible cause us to think in any way that this Bible is inferior to what we call the New Testament. Actually, what you call the New Testament was not, uh, was not considered to be a part of the canon until the fourth century. So I hope um, I mean, we have made it a little bit clear on that. So <clears throat> the issue is, I also mentioned something on the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. There's a difference between the, the, the Old Testament or the Bible and the Old Covenant. I said that the Old Covenant is in the Old Testament in script. And the New Testament, what, the New Covenant, is in the Old Testament in promise. Then we also say that what we call the New Testament records the fulfillment of the New Testament, the New Covenant, which is in the Old Testament in promise. So what we call the New Testament is actually swallowed up in the Old Testament. You can't have it without the other. That is why we said that one is authenticated by the other. When the writers of the, what we call the New Testament want to authenticate their claims, they used to say, as it is written, where? In what you call the Old Testament. Amen. <laughs> Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Bishop, for that clarification. And I want to believe that it is clarified. If you have more questions, we have Bishop tomorrow, so you can write those questions and send them to us, and uh, we'll have Bishop uh, respond to them. Tomorrow, we'll be meeting at 12 noon Kenyan time. Now we are international. 12 noon East African time. And I want to believe that the Lord will bless us. Thank you very much for staying on. I know some of us have been, I, I think I can count like nine or eight hours of, of the day that I've spent in meetings. Uh, some of us started at six when we started with our children um, our church. We got to seven, we had our teenager service and here we are with this conference and, and, and we are grateful that you all stayed on. Uh, you've spent your battles, you've spent your time. I want to believe that the Lord has blessed you and ministered to you. And I'm so grateful. Thank you very much. At this particular point, I want to invite Reverend Evans Wawero from uh, Worldwide Gospel Church in Gedongori. If you're in a position to pray for us, Reverend Evans Wawero, I want you to pray for us as, as we close tonight's meeting. Thank you very much, Reverend Wawero. I want also to compliment uh, what Bishop has said. This was very deep stuff. It has provoked our minds uh, to seek God and uh, that he may be revealed in our lives, that we may know him better. I'm so blessed. 
Thank you very much. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are so grateful this evening to receive and even to partake the bread of right. Thank you because of your word this evening. It has inspired us. It has impacted us, oh dear Father. And uh, through those teachings, we have understood the matters of sacrifice, the matters of giving, and even worshipping you. And how I pray that, oh God, you may help us to worship you in truth and even in spirit. I thank you because of your servant. Thank you for raising him in our generation, that he may be a blessing to us and even to the body of Jesus Christ. I thank you also because of our host, Reverend Waroe, for con convening this meeting to be a blessing to many, even during these times that we, are, that we are living. I pray for your blessings upon all of us. Even I speak special anointing upon your servants, O oh God, even as they minister tomorrow to the people that you have uh, committed and to them for nourishment and even teaching through your word. We bless you and we honor you. We thank you for this night. We are in your hands, O oh God, and therefore we know that we are safe. Blessed is your holy name. We bless you and we honor you, for it is in Jesus' name we pray and we believe. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. That marks the end of day three of our Bread of Life conference. We will see you tomorrow at noon. And I know you'll be blessed. You can now unmute as we say the words of the grace and bring this to a close. And now with the grace of our Lord Jesus, our Lord Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, the love of God, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. May the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may he make his face to shine upon you, may he be gracious to you and give you peace. Bless you. Amen. See you tomorrow. Amen. 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 Amen.